The number one reason why a furnace gets replaced is because of a bad heat exchanger. And since I have an open furnace right here that doesn't have an evaporator coil on it or a plenum, I thought I would give you a closer look so you can see up close and personal what this heat exchanger looks like. I'll also explain how it works and I'll point out the areas where these things usually fail. So let's start with the part itself. The heat exchanger is right over here. Usually it's gonna look like this. It'll either be cells or it's gonna be a tubular heat exchanger, a bunch of tubes. And depending on how big your furnace is, how many burners it has, that's how many tubes or cells it's gonna have. So this one right here is actually only two cells. Even though this furnace is huge, it can fit a lot more. There can be three, four, or five, or six of them here. But because likely this furnace was used to heat a small area, they put in air restrictors right here to force the air to go to the two cells only. And they're only pushing out air from the middle here. If this furnace was used to heat a bigger space, then there would most likely be either four, five, or six of these cells in here. And each one of them is connected to a burner up in front. Actually, let's take the front off and I'll show you real quick the burner chamber and where this connects to. This here is the burner box. The burners are inside of it and they're sealed off. Many high efficiency furnaces will have this style. Whereas the standard or 80% furnace, their burners are usually not enclosed and they're just out in the open. So let's take this door off real quick and see if we can get a better look at those burners. Right there we have our two burners. Unfortunately you still can't see them very well and I'll have to take apart way too much stuff to get to them. So I'm just going to leave it at this. Each of these burners that are going into the cells are about 20,000 BTU each. So this furnace right here is set up to be a 40,000 BTU furnace. And if they have three, then that would be 20,000 more. If they have five, that would be 100,000 BTU. And the purpose of a heat exchanger is to separate the exhaust fumes from your house air. So there's a blower motor on the bottom of the furnace. That thing blows air past these hot cells. The air gets heated and then distributed into your house. And the function of the heat exchanger is to separate the combustion fumes from your house air. Which means if you get a crack somewhere in the heat exchanger in one of these cells, then there's potential that some of those exhaust fumes, instead of going out your chimney, are going to start leaking out into your house air. Standard efficiency 80% furnaces will only have one heat exchanger, whereas high efficiency condensing furnaces, like this one right here, they're going to have two heat exchangers, a primary and a secondary heat exchanger. The easiest way to tell if you have an 80% standard efficiency furnace or a 90% plus high efficiency condensing furnace is to simply look at the venting. If your furnace has steel venting that goes into the chimney, then that is a standard efficiency furnace. But if the furnace has plastic PVC venting that goes out the side of the house, then you know that that is a high efficiency furnace. On these high efficiency furnaces, the secondary heat exchanger is always below the primary. So if I take this plate off, the air restrictor, we should be able to easily see our secondary heat exchanger. So that's how the secondary heat exchanger looks like. It's very similar to the primary, except the cells are a lot smaller and there's a lot more of them. Plus, it's built to be able to contain moisture because high efficiency furnaces, they condense moisture out of the exhaust fumes. Which also means that these high efficiency furnaces need a drain line so that all the water that it collects can go down the drain. If you look at the ends of those cells where they're attached to the back, you can see some calcium and rust buildup starting to form. Those are all potential leak points. But the biggest reason why these secondary heat exchangers go bad is not even because of a crack or a hole in the heat exchanger. Usually the reason they go bad is because they get plugged up. I know that in the past, some carrier furnaces had a known defect where the inner coating of the secondary heat exchanger would start to flake off and it would actually plug these cells, which would compromise the heat exchanger. Because being that it's plugged up, it's not venting properly. As for the primary heat exchanger, they don't have any moisture in them, so they don't run the risk of getting plugged up. So usually when these things go bad, they go bad because there's a hole or a crack that develops in the heat exchanger. Usually it's gonna be where the rivets are, or where the seams are, or these divots right here. Sometimes there's a hairline crack that develops inside of these things. By the way, if you hire a company to come out and check your furnace and they find a crack in your heat exchanger, even if it's really small, your furnace is automatically going to be deemed as unsafe to run. 
And some companies will even go as far as turning off your gas and disconnecting your furnace to make sure you don't run it. And if we look a little bit lower on the heat exchanger cell, we see these little things, which I like to call dimples. Look how these dimples look compared to the ones further down. Look at these guys. On these kind of heat exchangers, if they have any kind of rivets, those are oftentimes points of leakage. And if we look at the other side, let me just point out one more thing. Look where the screws go in, the screws that fasten the heat exchanger cells to the furnace cabinet. Look how they're all rusted and corroded. That's another common leak point where the screws go in, especially in the front right here where the burners are. And if we look at the secondary heat exchanger on this side, things look a little bit worse on this side. In fact, that corner right there where it's all rusted, that right there is probably a compromised secondary heat exchanger. But in a real life scenario, there's probably gonna be an evaporator coil and a plenum that's in the way. So you can't easily get to the heat exchangers and look at them like this. One of the ways that companies inspect your heat exchanger is by using this thing right over here. What we're looking at in between of these two cells is the high limit switch. If the air temperature gets too hot, this switch trips and turns the furnace off. On this furnace, the insides are very crowded, but on most furnaces, it isn't that bad. See, there's a gas valve in front of it. You got the inducer motor, the burner box on top, but usually this switch is pretty accessible, the one that's way back there. So they take this switch out and they route an inspection camera in between those heat exchanger cells. They look at all the seams, the rivets, the rings. But of course, the only place they can get to is in between these two cells right here. Another way to physically inspect the heat exchanger, especially the secondary heat exchanger, is to pull the whole blower housing out and then get on your back and slide in underneath the furnace and look up with the flashlight. After the blower is out and you get under there, you can see all the way through the furnace from the bottom. Regardless of which side you're looking at the heat exchanger from, chances are you're not going to be able to see all of it, every single side, but finding just one little hole or one little crack is enough to call the whole heat exchanger bad. Carbon monoxide leaks could be very dangerous, and because the heat exchanger is responsible to keep that stuff out of your house, if it develops even a little bit of a crack, it should be taken seriously. I have a whole video on carbon monoxide leaks and natural gas leaks and why they're dangerous, so if you want to know some more details on that, check that one out. Another thing that I want to point out is that physically inspecting the heat exchanger is usually done as verification, not to actually find the leak or the crack. If I come out to do a furnace inspection, the way I would check if the heat exchanger is good or not is by doing a combustion analysis. That's when I stick a probe into the exhaust pipe and see what the levels of carbon monoxide are going out the chimney or out the side of your house if you have a high efficiency furnace. If I see that the carbon monoxide levels are super high, then I wouldn't even need to physically verify anything. If the CO levels are super high, that furnace is automatically bad, that heat exchanger is compromised. But if the carbon monoxide levels are higher than usual, not alarming, just higher than the normal, then I would investigate further. Maybe the gas pressures are set incorrectly, or maybe I need to clean up the burners, maybe there's something wrong with the venting. After checking some of those things, that's when I would physically take a look at that heat exchanger, wherever I can access it, to see if I see any holes or cracks in it. And for those of you wondering why heat exchangers crack in the first place, it's simply because wear and tear. Heat exchangers get really hot, the cells or the tubes, and metal expands and contracts from heat. So every single time the furnace kicks on, the flames come on, those heat exchanger cells or tubes, they get super hot. Then they cool down, it turns back on, they heat up again. Cooling, heating, cooling, heating. And from all of that stress, expanding, contracting, expanding, contracting, all the seams, the rivets, and the little rings on the heat exchangers, with time, they wear out and start to crack. And if for some reason there's moisture where it's not supposed to be, that also adds rust to the mix, which further decreases the lifespan of that heat exchanger. Another logical question is, why not just replace the heat exchanger alone and not the whole entire furnace? And the simple answer is, it's very expensive to do so. 
If you have a newer furnace that still has warranty, then it might be worth it. But if your furnace is older than 10 years old, chances are you don't have the warranty on it anymore, and replacing the heat exchanger is going to cost about $3,000. All of these parts right here need to be gutted, everything needs to come out, then the whole entire heat exchanger comes out as one big assembly, the new one comes in, and everything needs to be reassembled. This takes a very long time, so most companies are more than happy to charge you quite a bit to do it. For most people, once they find out how much it would cost to replace just the heat exchanger, they opt to just get a whole new furnace because that seems a whole lot more cost effective. But if you have any kind of heat exchanger experiences of your own, I would love to hear from you in the comment section below.